Welcome to the New York City Accessibility and Inclusive Design Meetup. I'm Cameron. Uh, this is Thomas and Sean here. They're the co-organizers of this meetup. We meet uh, about every month, first Tuesday of the month, um, to talk about accessibility uh, in a broad range of disciplines. And today, uh, we're here at ThoughtBot. We wanted to thank ThoughtBot for hosting us here today and for uh, sponsoring the food, and also to thank SSB Barker for their ongoing sponsorship of the meetup. Um, also, Jolie with the Internet Society is here streaming the event. We're live streaming today, so um, we may get some questions coming in from the World Wide Web. And uh, we'll, with that, without further ado, I'll hand it off uh, to Jake Woodco, and you can talk to us about color bias. Other friends meet up, and he asked me to come in, modify it for you guys, and then give it here. So here I am. If you're interested in contacting me after this, I am extremely easy to find online. Uh, I am Jake Boyko at Gmail, at Jake Boyko, Jake Boyko at GitHub, like any service, Jake Boyko. The last time I gave the talk, I noticed that the color was off on the projector. It looks okay here, I mean, as far as my poor eyes can tell. But if you want during the talk to go and look on your phones, I have a Twitter bot set up that has a bunch of after pictures uh, of what the world looks like to somebody who's red blind. So if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see some of the pictures from this talk. Or alternatively, if you want to send a picture of your own, you can send, you know, tweet it at Jake, Boyd, at Jake would see, and it'll respond with a colorblind version of your image. I wrote it in Node.js, so it'll probably respond with the colorblind version of your image. So the talk is divided into three pieces. First, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk through how do eyes work normally if you have like, healthy eyes with full color vision. And then you know, I'm, re again, red blind. How, do, how does the world look different to me? Like why and why does the world look different to me? Then I, I'm going to tell you kind of how to model it. There's a, a very easy uh, way to model this in uh, color vision processing where you can get like, pretty good estimates of, of what I see. It's not perfect, but it's still a good estimate and can give you an idea of kind of the challenges that I face or don't face, rather, in, in my day-to-day -day life. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about the, you know, some simple techniques that you can apply to your, your daily avoid the issue. The format for all of these images is on the left. Those are, that are at cafeteria doors, and they're and you know, hurting this came up with is that they would color one of the doors so then it would be fixed. So that was kind of an interest that just based purely on color. So let's get into it. Uh, how do eyes that are fully functioning normally work? You detect color in your eyes through these three structures that are called cones. And the three different types detect different parts of the visible wavelength. You have long cones, which I myself am missing, which detects uh, the colors that I list here, reds, oranges, yellows, and greens. Then you have in the middle these medium length cones that detect a lot of like the yellows and greens. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have uh, these cones called short cones that detect blues and cyan. Um, interestingly, if you took the lenses out of your eyes, the short cones could actually detect ultraviolet light, but your lenses filter it out so you actually can't see that. And then basically what your brain does for any part of your vision, it takes all of the inputs from the cones in that part of the vision and combines them together. So for instance, if the, you know, for like one part of your vision, your long and medium cones are going off the chart like, hey, I'm getting a big hit, and then your short cones see nothing, your brain's going to go, oh, this is yellow or yellowish. So it's also useful to know, because I'm producing these images for computer monitors, how do we represent color in the real world. You know, obviously, you know, computer monitors can't just, you know, put like a, a real color somewhere. It has to kind of fake it somehow. So it's useful to know uh, for people who are new to, you know, how images work, how color is represented. So 
the idea is that instead of like representing the full spectrum of colors, you have three different colors that are called primaries. And each of the primaries targets one of the three cones that are in your eyes. So um, one of the primaries targets the long wavelength, one of the primaries targets the medium wavelength, and one of the primaries targets the short wavelength cones. And the idea is that by modifying how much of one of those primaries are, you will modify how much that particular cone is responding. And you know, there's some overlap between the cones, so it's not perfect, but you can do a pretty good job of picking colors so that you can re you know, represent most of what you can see. Something interesting that I learned when I was learning all about all of this is that you can't actually reproduce all colors using just three primaries. Like, it's just not possible. But you can do like a pretty good job. Like, it gets, it gets most of the job done. Um, and you know, in grade school, I had learned that primary colors can reproduce all colors. So that was kind of like an interesting fact that I had learned. In additive color spaces, which are in color spaces used on like computer monitors and, and projectors, where you're adding together lights to produce other lights, you are using RGB, red, green, blue. Um, and one version in particular uh, is the one that is like the predominant one, like on phones and color, you know, phones, computer monitors, so on and so forth. And on the bottom here, I show you, you know, those three colors, which are red, green, and the landmark Miles Davis album, Kind of Blue. So what's different about me? As I mentioned a few times already, I am completely missing the long wavelength cone. This you know, affects about 1 in 200 people. It's kind of a rarer version of colorblindness. About 5% of the population are colorblind. And uh, the most common type is to not be missing a, a cone, but to have kind of like a weakened version of one, so that the, the other two cones dominate the third cone. The effect of this on me is that I really can't see reds at all. I kind of see them as, as very dark. And orange, yellows, and greens are, are affected too, to, to varying degrees. To give you an idea of how different vision is for me, most people can see about 150 different wavelengths of color. In your head right now, guess how many different wavelengths you think I see. Sean knows the answer already, because I sent him the slides. But the answer is I can differentiate about 17 wavelengths. So a little over a tenth of the color people can see are, are what I can differentiate. And that's not saying like bright green and dark green and stuff like that. That's just if you look at like a pure spectrum that a prism splits of, of pure white light. So the, as I mentioned before, <laughs> there are, uh, yeah, right? So as I mentioned before, the, the, the most common type of colorblindness is to have two cones that dominate a third cone. So using some clever filtering techniques, you can attenuate that response. And there's this company called Enchroma that makes these glasses that you, know, you put them on. You, know, you may have seen videos online of people putting them on and crying at sunsets and stuff like that. And what happens is it takes those two strong cones and attenuates them so that they're just as weak as the third cone. So you get these balances of colors that, are, you know, that you've never perceived before. Like you've never been able to see it before. So you can, you know, people with these uh, weakened conditions can perceive more colors. So I went on, you know, I was excited when I heard about that. I went online, I like, you know, did their vision test and they're like, oh, sorry, like you're too colorblind for this test. But like as a consolation prize, here's a whole bunch of information about your condition. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm, you know, that's, that's great for me. I love, I love reading about, you know, colorblindness and learning about things in general. So I'm reading through it and one sentence really stuck out to me. It was, you know, and, you know, people with protonopia, which is the condition that I have, will even perceive colors in the wrong part of the spectrum. For instance, they'll perceive peanut butter as green. And I needed to read that sentence three times before it really sank in, because my entire life I have thought that peanut butter was green. Um, and I found out last year that it is in fact not green, it's kind of brownish, which was news to me and no one else. <laughs> so now that we know what's different about me, it's useful to talk about kind of how to model it so that we can program it, so that we can kind of like produce an image on the output. So there's a lot of chicken, my chicken scratch on this slide. I'm going to spend some time here because it's a little bit dense. So when you are working with colors, it's not really convenient to work with RGB because it's a three-dimensional space. Um, and it's more convenient to work in color spaces that are designed around how, how our eyes function. So there's this one in particular called XYY where it takes brightness and makes brightness an entire axis. So if you only want to work with color, you can throw the brightness axis out and work only with the, uh, what's called the, uh, 
chrominance uh, axes, x and y. Um, so it's luminance and chrominance. So the way that colors kind of fall in the spectrum when you draw colors out, all the primaries fall along this like upside down U thing. So red, orange, yellow, green, and then if you swing all the way around, it ends up as blue, indigo, and violet. That's like the f like a, a eye that's functioning fully will see anything within this U. <laughs> you don't like reading text on my face. So, <laughs> so when I was mentioning before that there are three primary colors, uh, red, green, and blue, if the idea is about the same. And then white ends up all the way in the center. So the difference between what you see and what I see is actually a little obscured by the, the teleprompter. So I'm gonna, but there's enough here that I can uh, talk you through it. So what I see differently is instead of seeing everything inside of this U, I only see a single. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I only see a single parabola that intersects the U. So that you know that gives you another idea of like I, it wasn't until I found that out that I realized like how compromised my color vision is. That like you know everybody else sees every, the, you know the world in this like two dimensions of color, and for me it's collapsed down into this one line. And for anybody who you know, is monochromatic, they only have one cone, it would just be a single dot somewhere, either like around here probably or around here probably. So that was uh, you know, a big wake-up call for me. But that big wake-up call makes it very useful for modeling uh, relatively accurately what I see as a colorblind person. Because all you need to do is find a way to transform this two-dimensional graph of colors down into this parabola that I see. So we. A lot of you know, vision researchers have done a lot of work to determine what colors you know, I can fuse together. And it turns out that they're, they mostly form you know, these like collinear branches, where any two colors that I can fuse will fall along these lines, which I, you see radiating out here. And also, extremely conveniently, they all tend to meet at a point. So the consequence of that is if you draw, if you have a color, a real color, that falls somewhere inside of this U thing. Oh, man, I'm shaking the projector. I'm sorry. Um, all you need to do is take this point and take the point where the real color is and find out where that line intersects this parabola. And it's not 100% perfect. I'll kind of go through where, what, it, what the strengths of that approach are and what the weaknesses of that approach are later. But it does a, a very good job. And again, like I'm sorry for having to take you through my chicken scratch. I didn't find a, an image that kind of portrayed this quite the way I wanted. So I kind of hacked together my own. So I programmed this the first time. And it looked pretty good, except that there were some brightness issues. Like, it seemed like the hue was right, but the brightness of the image was completely wrong. So the approach, a lot, all the papers that I were basing my implementation on all cited the same paper from back in 1944. So I, I dug up a PDF of it online. It's, it was published by NIST, so it was available for free, thankfully. And it was this like massive, dense paper, like 30 plus pages of you know, very dense academic literature. And I read through it and understood you know, it the best that I could. And finally, at the very you know, end of it, at the very bottom of a footnote, there's a mention that people with protonopia, which is the type of colorblindness that I have, they perceive reds as being very dark. Like you can't just take the luminance of a normal person and assume that that's what I see, that you actually need to model it separately. And that actually made a lot of sense to me because my entire life, you know, people, they find out I'm colorblind, you know, what color is this, what color is this, what color is this? And when it got to things that are red and green, I could generally tell because reds look a lot darker to me. So if something was dark, like, you know, stoplights look very dark to me, like emergency signs look dark to me, like I could say that that was probably red because most people don't color things dark green. And, you know, people will be like, you're not really colorblind. And, you know, I, I promise you that I am. Um, but once I was able to apply it, there, so there's like a simple formula that this paper had that let you model brightness. And once you apply it, um, then the results look pretty good. You know, there, there are still some issues which I'm going to talk through, but it's a, it's a great first approximation of how a colorblind person sees the world. And, you know, I'm talking a lot. If anyone has a question, just raise your hand and uh, we can get to you. So again, I, I have a Twitter bot up. So I'm not going to talk too much about this, except to say that um, it actually was able to engage my mother in my colorblindness. Because whenever she sees like a painting or something like that, now she sends tweets at my, my Twitter bot to see what her brother or my cousin or me like, would see if we looked at it. So it's like you know, her entire life, she's been surrounded by colorblind people. 
And now she finally was able to, to get an idea of, of what I see as a colorblind person. I took through, I went through all of the images that I've ever taken, like any, any picture that I've ever taken, and I calculated what was, what's called the root mean square deviation of all of the images. And basically what that means is instead of summing together all of the errors, like you know, basically how the original pixel versus the, the new pixel, I summed together the square of the errors with the goal of finding images that had regions that were very different. And out of all of the images that I've ever taken, this was the one that was the most changed before and after. Um, I do see a little bit of a color difference on this projector, so it might be worth bringing up on a phone. But uh, the before and after look you know, basically identical to me on a phone. And that's kind of ironic for a lot of reasons, primarily of which I painted this myself at a bring your own beer painting class. So it just goes to show that with enough you know, careful instruction, I can accomplish just about anything. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was making this, you know, when I do, oh, question. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Uh, the headlines at the top of the slides are deep red. And she was asking how you know that they're deep red. I can read the hex values of colors <laughs> and, and <laughs> tell that way. Um, that's, this is, this is a, a slide deck that I did through Apple. You know, a lot of times I rely on default presentations and default styling of things. So any styling in this presentation is all thanks to Apple and any errors are thanks to me. Um, so when I was implementing this, you know, when I do a good job of implementing this program, the image that I put into it looks the same to me as the image that comes out of it. So I was bugging my friends endlessly, sending them, you know, all of these before and after images like, hey, like, what does this look like? What does this look like? So for this, this flamingo picture, I sent it to my friend Lindsay and, you know, asked her to tell me, like, if the, the two images were different. And she responds, they look very different. And she, you know, goes through the differences to her. You know, she says that the sand and the flamingo and the sun, they're all very orange and there are pinks. And in the second one, everything is this, like, dull gray and yellow. And that made me really happy, you know, because my, my program is working now. So I'm like, thanks, they look almost identical to me. And she just responds with frowny face, your life is sad. Which since I've made this program is a response that I've gotten a lot. And no, it's not. <laughs> so another thing that I was really excited to try was finding out what color the dress was, or more accurately, testing my friends. So, you know, for those of you who don't know, there was this phenomenon that went around the internet last year where these, uh, this uh, British teenager was shopping for wedding dresses, snapped a few crappy cell phone pictures, and posted them on Instagram because her and her friends all thought that the dresses had a very obvious color, but half of her and her friends thought that the dress was obviously white and gold, and the other half thought that the dress was obviously blue and black. Uh, and it basically, it turns out that it depends on whether you think that it's in a dark room or a bright room, it causes you to think one or the other. But I was, I've only ever been able to see it as blue and black. So once I had this program, I was like, hey, like, you know, you know, I have friends that can see, you know, force themselves to see it both ways. You know, maybe I can only see it in blue and black because I'm colorblind. So I, you know, ran it through it. I sent it to my friends who can see it. And they're like, no, like, it definitely still looks, you know, I can definitely still see white and gold in it. Like, the problem is on your end. Like, it's not, you can't just blame it on your eyes. So that was a sad moment for me. I'm still, I'm still waiting for the day that I see it as white and gold. So, <laughs> I get that a lot. <laughs> so this was another really interesting image in that when I was preparing the last talk that I gave, oh, do you want, do you want some? <laughs> so when I was preparing this talk the last time, uh, I, I put these up just because it was one of the top most different you know, from before and after images. And my friend Sarah, who ran the meetup that I presented this at and was looking over my slides for make sure I didn't swap any images or whatever, asked me, you know, what, was I out of my mind when I ate sushi? You know, she was like, you know, the one on the right is rancid, I would never eat it. And then she asked me a very interesting question. She was like, does sushi ap actually look appetizing to you? And honestly, truthfully, no, it, it, it does not. Like the salmon in the center, yes, like that looks tasty, like I would eat that. But, you know, whatever's on the top and whatever's on the bottom, like if I didn't know that my friend Tyler was not trying to poison me, I would never put it in my mouth. <laughs> So let's get into some of the problems with the approach that I had. So 
this was an image that was very interesting in that it is, I think, much more different to me than it is to other people. So I see the table on the right as being maybe like twice the brightness, maybe 50 to 100% of the brightness is the table on the left. But most people who look at this say that they, they don't appear that different, or like it's bright but not that, the difference isn't that much for brightness. Um, so what I think is happening is that the, the processing technique that I used shifted the red and didn't the like, you know, linear correction for brightness doesn't do like a, a great job for me in particular. So it give, comes out like a relatively close before and after for brightness for somebody with regular vision, but it doesn't do it great for me. This was actually, as, as again, I had a friend look <coughs> over my last slide deck and she was saying that I should probably just take this image out altogether because it didn't look very different before and after. Um, but I, you know, I'm leaving it in because the difference is actually pretty significant before and after for me, but not necessarily for other people. Um, these kind of shifts happen in other images. My, so there are two errors that I can detect in this image. One is that I have the same type of brightness image in the before and after on my shirt. And then on my dad's shirt, I actually see kind of a hue shift. Like it shifts more towards green on the right hand side than it does on the left hand side. Um, to have another image where this, this hue shift happened, this was probably the image that appeared the most different before and after to me. Just because the table, I can see like a noticeable shift towards green um, from what I imagine is red. So I sent this to my friend Hannah, who's in the picture, and I was like, "Hey, like, you know, this is, you know, can I use this picture or whatever?" And you know, she was telling me that you know the whole image looked different to her. Like for me, the only difference is the table. But she was saying like, you know, everything is different, like down to the color of her skin and stuff like that. So you know, while to me it seems like a failure image, it, I think it still does a decent job of kind of portraying the before and after. Um, difference for, for people with my type of, of vision problems, protonopia. So let's get into the final part of the talk, you know, kind of what can you do? So as kind of a motivating example, here is the colorblind process version of the Late, so, the late Show with Stephen Colbert logo. So with normal vision, I'm sure this looks totally fine. Like you can actually see reds as having a brightness and a vibrance. So it would be like bright red on blue. But for me, reds all appear very dark. So the, Stephen, the late night with Stephen Colbert logo has always appeared like very strange to me because it seems like you know the rest of the typography is very crisp and <laughs> pops out, and then you have like the late show, which like really hides because it's this like dark red on this dark blue. Um, so I hope that kind of comes through for you guys on this. Okay, cool. So you know, how do you avoid doing things like that? You know, obviously, like for for a, you know a lot of sites and designs and stuff like that. If you're working on small audiences, it probably doesn't matter. But you know, I'm sure the designers of you know, Late Night, or Late Show with Stephen Colbert, who appeal to like, try to appeal to literally every person in America, you know, they probably would have wanted to know that you know, over a million people in America would say, hey, your logo looks kind of weird. Um, so there's a couple of techniques that I'm going to kind of walk through one at a time. Um, but, yes? Is it don't put red on blue or if you do, one better be a whole lot darker than the other. It kind of hurts to look at, so please don't in general. But if you, but but to your point, yes, like uh, if like it would have to be like you know very 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 bright red on like a very dark Deep blue. Blue-ish. Yeah, exactly. But can I just want to follow with that question? Sure. I, I don't I don't know how other more full range vision people feel in this room, but I find from a design standpoint, red on a solid blue background is a little, pain, as you described, a little painful. Yeah. It's, it's jarring. <laughs> you know? Well, it's so very it's jarring for me, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad to know that other people feel my pain. <laughs> There's another question over here. Yeah, is that specific to your specific type of color blindness, or is that like, if someone had like a no medium color, would that be true? I'm not sure for the, the no medium or weak medium or the no short or weak short, but for um, both the most common type of color blindness and for my particular type of kind of color blindness, um, it's a problem. Where the, the most com common type is kind of like the halfway point between what I see and what a normal person sees, um, where you have like a weak uh, red detecting code. Um, it, I, it affects them, but not, not nearly to the extent that it does for me. I have a, I have a, a good friend of mine is, has, uh, is protonomalous, which is the like halfway version of protonopia. And he says that it's like a problem, but you know, he says that I complain about it way more than he does. So I think you know, I, I'm, 
I think it affects me more than it affects him. <clears throat> um, so let's walk through the techniques just one at a time. Um, they're kind of very simple and very easy to apply. And I'm just going to show you uh, sometimes applications that do these things very well and sometimes applications that do these things very poorly. So I'm a recovering Candy Crush addict. I never spent any money on it, but I spent a lot of time on it. And one of the reasons I spent a lot of time on it is that even though it's a very color-based game and a very colorful game, every color is paired with a unique shape. So they don't use just color to differentiate any single thing in their game. They just use it as kind of like this extra highlighting thing. So the problem that I would have had is, I don't even know what to call these things. There's like a hard candy and a jelly. And they look very similar to me. This is, I think, the colorblind process version of my image. Um, and I was able to play the game because they, they gave all of the, the candy such a unique shape and uh, <coughs> you know different brightnesses and stuff like that that like really with any you know, type of you know, vision impairment, just so long as you can see at all, you'll be able to, to play the game because everything will really stand out to you. Um, now, there's, oh, there's something later that's a follow-up. I kind of ordered these slides a little poorly. So another thing that you can do is uh, test in grayscale. Could you do me a favor and put the, yeah. thank you. I didn't realize that there was gonna be uh, text on the bottom, so I would have designed the slides around that. Um, but, so, one thing that, so one thing that I did when I was trying to make this slide is I just went on the Data is Beautiful subreddit and went to the top posts of all time and just started scanning down until I ran into a visualization that I had problems with. And it didn't take very long to find it. So there was this, um, somebody had done kind of a sentiment analysis of a bunch of different subreddits um, that, that are sports related for when they're happy and when they're sad. And the problem that I had, uh, which now you all have because I made this image grayscale, was that they made happiness red and or they made sadness red and mm -hmm. happiness green. So when things were at extremes, they looked kind of the same to me. So when I looked at this thing, I wasn't 100% sure what the graph was actually representing because it's labeled moody subreddits. I didn't know if it's very moody, if they're very unhappy, or you know, if the you know, maximum was because they were very positive, so they had a lot of mood, I don't know. So one thing that the, the visualizer of this data may have wanted to do would be to flip it in grayscale. Because as soon as you look at that, like it doesn't matter how much color vision you have, you say this is a problem, like it's really hard to tell what's going on here. So they may have, try, they may have tried to find another method of, of representing this data. So the, th the good thing about testing in grayscale is that you don't even need to worry about like what type of color blindness you're, you know, if, if it works in grayscale, it'll even work for people with monochromatic vision. You know, just as long as you, What's like, that? You said that reds are much darker for you? Yes. Well, Grace, like, I know Mac had, when I was saying you can turn on grayscale through the accessibility map, like, will that capture that experience that you have with the darkness? It's hard to say because so many programs uh, implement grayscale poorly. Um, the, it turns out that different color channels contribute to brightness different ways, and most people don't know that. So the grayscale representation is usually a like not very accurate, so it's kind of hard to answer that like generally for all things. Yeah, you can do a test afterward, basically bring up one of the slides with a side by side. Yeah. And then put your Mac in grayscale and we'll see what the difference looks like. You could do that. <coughs> um, question on the back. Oh, oh sure, question. Yeah, um, on the point of going grayscale, if you were to invert the colors, um, sometimes like a high contrast one does that, um, does that affect the perception of the differentiation between red and That's another interesting point where it's hard to generalize that because um, the luminance of grayscale is not linear. It's actually um, uh, done with something called a gamma curve where the, um, the, the medium gray, the neutral gray, wouldn't be uh, color 128 of 256. It would be about 185. Well, I think it's 186 actually. Um, but most, again, most programs don't do that. They don't know it's not linear. So it's one of those things where like, um, in practice, it should be fine flipping it. Like it should give you the the difference, but you know because of most people don't implement it the correct way, it's not you know it's likely not going to work, and for different reasons. Yeah, this is one of those things where knowing this much about vision processing turns into more of a curse than a <laughs> than a blessing. Um, please underline your links. Oh God, oh God, please underline your links. 
my entire web fairing life, whenever designers sway away from the blue link on white background uh, palette, I have so many problems. I can't tell you how many times I've read blogs for years and then happen to mouse over a paragraph and suddenly my mouse cursor flips into the, you know, please click this link uh, cursor. And I never realized that the blog that I've been reading for years has been linking to comp you know, dozens of different sources that I may have found interesting or insightful. There is a, a, a good example here is the colorblind process a version of just a, a story that popped up on my, my Twitter feed where there are three different links. There are two at mentions that are links. And then there's a third, which is obviously a URL, which is clickable. Um, but because it's done in red, I have like a, a difficult time realizing that these are actually clickable. Um, with the context where, you know, some, where these things are obviously links, it's, it's a little better because just as an experienced web user, I know that I can click these things and probably get where I'm going. But because, you know, this is something that literally affects you from birth, you know, somebody who's not fluent in, you know, web trends and web conversion or not like any type of like web uh, convention might have problems. Like they might not realize they can click it. Might, they not, may not realize that they can go places. So this just goes back to the Candy Crush example where it's very useful to pair together um, call outs that something is an action along with the color that indicates that it's an action. Um, one thing that's not an underline that I've seen some websites do is that they include like kind of like a little arrow next to a link. Like a lot of news websites do this where you're showing that you're gonna you know, leave the, like there's like an external link somewhere. So like while it's not strictly underlined, it's still visually you know, useful, you know, it still gives you visually useful information to say like, hey, this is like something that's a, you know, that I'm explicitly calling you to that you can click and do something with. Oh God, please underline your links. So this kind of brings us to the end of my talk or everything that I've prepared. To kind of summarize everything that I've gone over, most people, can you know, see color normally because they have three cones in their eyes. I am missing one of them, so I uh, have a, a reduced you know, perspective on the world. I see a, you know, a little over a tenth of the colors that most people can perceive. It's very easy to model this if you remember the graph that I had with the upside down U. Everybody can see basically in two dimensions on that graph, and for me it's collapsed down into a single parabola. And by intersecting what, what the, those confusion lines with the parabola, it gives you an estimate of the color that I see. Um, I wrote a Twitter bot, which you can use, and I gave you some easy tips to make this accessible. And oh god, please underline your links, please, please. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yes. So um, at the beginning, talking about uh, like seventeen wavelengths. Yeah. Is that another way to think about like, uh, your vocabulary for describing color perceived would be in 17? Yeah, that's, that, that'd be an interesting way of saying it. <laughs> so do you have like, I mean, is that something that from a descriptive piece with any other colors other than red that you? I see blues very well. Um, I've always, like, I've always liked blue Christmas lights. I can pick them out very easily. I think, you know, I would confuse them with purple Christmas lights because they have red in them and I don't see the red part of it. Um, you know, yellows, um, bright greens, like, those are all colors that I can like imagine pretty easily. On the other hand, there are these like colors in the middle that are, I think, a combination of a lot of wavelengths, like maybe salmon or, and stuff like that, where it's like I look at it and like I literally don't understand what I'm seeing. Like it's hard for me to like, not only do I not know what it is, but it's hard for me to pin it to any other part of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the back. Uh, just a couple of notes. One, uh, uh, two blocks, the app has an options for colorblind. And what they do, they have colors that are a bit more in contrast, and mm -hmm. they also have shapes in them, so you can differentiate them better. Right. And I really like that. This is the option that I fly on. Uh, and second, there's a Mac app that's called Oracle uh, that you can switch all the different color buttons to see the photos that you're looking at or the screen that you're looking right. at. Right. That's a good point. Yeah, there are, there are also ways that you can test for individual color blindness. It's, it's worth when you use them, finding people who have these color blindnesses and, and running it by them. I, I needed to do a, a lot of tweaking to my program to get it accurate. Like I kind of like went over the high level, but there was a lot of stuff. Apparently between different color spaces, they, they literally have different whites. Like you need to actually like convert the, you know, the whites that you see uh, between them. 
you know, there's like a lot of like all these like little processing <coughs> steps that like made it. So the, the only reason that I got even close is because I already have this color blindness. Like if I were programming this for somebody with deuteranopia where they're missing the medium wavelength code, like I would probably need to track down somebody who has that condition and say like, hey, does this kind of look close to what you see? Um, so yeah, it's useful to, to use these tools and but you, if you're like really relying on them, it's like worth having like a, a real person as a backup just to verify that the tool is, is doing what it, what it says it's doing. Um, yes? Can you talk about, uh, like are there really popular tools that you're referring to? Um, the, the one in the back that was just talking about one. Can you tell me it was called Oracle, the tool? There's a tool called Oracle that does this. <laughs> but I, I, I've never used it. I would, I would try to find somebody with color line just to kind of double check what it does. Fujitsu has one called Color Doctor. Yes? Here, Professor Shen. Some people, some people who have color blindness. Then you tell me that they got a word. Color blindness. They got it. I go right. I go right. Correct. I go right. The class of channel because they're dead demons. They can't see any colors. So, they can't see any colors. They can't see any colors. They can't see any colors. Color deficiency. Yes, that's right. The technical term for it is like red green color deficiency. Um, the term used to, that used to be used was red blindness and green blindness, and they're extremely inaccurate. While for red blindness, I pretty much can't see red, people who are green blind can see green. Um, so it's kind of this like old term from the 30s that's kind of like persisted um, mm -hmm. until today. I just want to say I think your sushi demo is like the most compelling <laughs> color blindness. It's why I need a taster for all of my food before I get it. <laughs> In the back. Yeah, the one thing I noticed when you were talking about the Candy Crush game was that it, anecdotally, I would say that having clear distinction aside from color is useful for everyone. Do you know of any user usability studies or research that points to that being like broadly true? Um, I, I just realized I've been bad at repeating questions. So the, the question is, uh, what, uh, are there any studies that have shown that pairing uh, colors with you know, shapes or labels is helpful? I've only seen anecdotal studies. Like I've, there's this uh, guy who's a really big design guy called Don Norman. He, you know, he kind of wrote one of the handbooks on it um, called The Design of Everyday Things. And I've seen him give talks where he talks about this. You know, he, um, you know, I feel kind of embarrassed because in Google Docs we always had just images, and he says that like just images or just words or just colors are all okay-ish, but you know the best thing to do is pair them together. Um, like in one talk, he explicitly said that the best way that you can get a user to understand what's going is to pair a shape with a label, um, and I'm sure color would even only strengthen that. Is there any case of it having a negative impact? I, I mean, sure. I can't think of anything. But I'm just uh, are there, is there a case of it having a negative impact? Like, I'm sure it's possible to come up with it, but just like off the top of my head, like I can't think of anything. Like it seems like one of those things where it's like, yeah. it's probably almost always strictly better. Yeah. And you know, the, the negative impact is that you're taking up more space, mm -hmm. which is likely why most applications don't do it. You know, especially on, you know, as, as screens get smaller and smaller, vertical spaces, like is at such a premium that it's it's hard to, to justify it. If you look at Microsoft Office, they did a redesign of their ribbon where if you look at the first screen, it's all of the images that you, you've already memorized, you know, bold, italic, underline. They don't pair it with anything. If you go into literally any other menu, they've decided that the vertical space is worth giving up to pair a label with all of the images that they have for every literally every other function that Microsoft Office does. Yes. I just want to say it was really cool that you brought up the, the blue and red not um, not being put together. I used to teach art for a really long time, right. and uh, I would always see the desire to take every primary color at the highest <laughs> chroma, just mm -hmm. smash them next to each other. Right. And um, one of the reasons that it doesn't work is because our eyes are terrible and fuzzy and really just not good at figuring out what's next to each other. So it's um, it'll actually start kind of crossing the signal and mm -hmm. cancel each other out. So there's that option oh. where it basically right goes at those edges. It'll right. actually make whatever happens a little darker. Right. So it'll create this illusion that things are actually kind of have this weird, like, kind of yeah. like lines look like. That's cool. And I've so never heard of that. It's good for everybody, too. That's what I'm saying. It's 
good across the board to not combine the Do you happen to know the name of that interference pattern? Um, it's one Google search away for me. <laughs> 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 um, but it's basically because it's because your eyes are saying like this is really red, this is really blue, right. but that right where they're next to each other, just like a little fuzzy signal. Where like, yeah. and when colors mix, they that, that's why you can't mix a a perfect color palette for the primary ones is because they. Um, they start canceling each other out, mm -hmm. becoming more neutral and more. That's why when you mix them all together, it's get gray. Right. Um, it's that same thing. They start canceling each other out right there at those intersections, and our eyes are not fixed. Mm -hmm. They're way worse. Cool. Um, I, don't know, I just thought it was cool because it just never connected for this. Right. Any other questions? Oh, two more. Uh, <laughs> over here, you have one. Yeah. Hi, I'm a teacher, and okay. I'm wondering, like, as a kid growing up, how because like, I make posters and I use red and blue all the time. Like it's my go-to, and I have the most fun markers for it. So, like, as <laughs> what would you have wished that your teacher had done to make things less aggravating? For you? Okay, so what would I? Have, so, growing up, how did this kind of affect my education? Yeah. Is the question. And I guess the answer is that I may, in some ways, happen to have lucked out because I'm a very analytical learner. Like, you know, I'm very comfortable when I'm looking at math equations and stuff like that. So I think maybe the color didn't matter so much to me. You know, anything that, it, that, that my teachers would do with color would usually be to try to differentiate two concepts uh, with color to like kind of highlight it. But that was always like a very easy separation for me to do naturally, like how to, you know, split things up and categorize them and stuff like that. Um, so like maybe it would have strengthened it. Just kidding. Okay. Christmas. Mm -hmm. Is that, is, I mean, to me at that, that, that season, I go, oh, here comes the red and green. It's yeah. an assault, you know. But I'm wondering if, the, for me, if that even red comes to gray and more gray. Yeah, it doesn't register. <laughs> <laughs> so you got off the hook on that one. I guess I did. <laughs> yes. So if, for leaks, are you saying basically don't use red or like you're expecting? Because that, that oh, for me, for me specifically. Commonly speaking, it's the red and green is the most. Is that? I mean, the default is blue. Um, I, mean, like, I don't know what the most. Oh yeah, red. Like, sorry, red green. Most yes, that's right. Red, red green is the most popular um, type of color blindness. With so many like major calls to action, buttons being orange and red. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're looking darker for you. How does that? Like, what would you suggest? For so calls to action are interesting in that marketing people have kind of figured out that like calls to action that are orange with like blue color schemes are very clickable. So that happens to be very easily differentiable for basically everybody, so that's nice. It's really when you have like custom websites that are made either by designers or for, for smaller uh, audiences where like red is an easy example to, to make, but just because I have such a, a broad range of colors that can be confused together, like it's very easy to find two colors uh, that you know, would look about the same to me but would look different to somebody with normal color vision. Um, so the like, Pairing, so it's like, I guess the rule would either be like stick with safe color combinations or alternatively, like somehow highlight that links are, are different. So, specifically for if it's um, like, if it's a contrasting color, I understand that there's a difference, but if it's a, uh, it's like an analogous color, like something where they're hmm. um, more complementary, or, like, or if they want that yellow and orange going, um, what would you recommend doing? Would it be messing with? Luminance or something. Is there something where like, you're stuck with this color palette that you know is going to be toxic? And I would just ask you to underline the links, please. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's like flat out the easiest way to just get it working for everybody is to like somehow call them out as different. Cool. Yes. So for when you're driving, the the red is just a lot darker than the green. Oh, I, I guess at traffic lights. <laughs> okay. No, it's all, sorry, <laughs> old joke. Um, so that's a that's a great common, question. But common, very common question. But I'm just curious. So this used to be a problem. They used to not design traffic lights to be colorblind safe. So uh, I actually ran, went, drove through a city once that had non colorblind safe traffic lights. It was this terrifying experience. I was driving in high school with my friend Ian to Asbury Park, and Asbury Park had not updated their their traffic lights. So I'm driving towards the first light that has this problem, and, and it's red. But the traffic light looks like it's completely off to me. Like nothing is, is lit up on the traffic light. So I'm getting closer and I'm getting closer. And I ask, is that traffic light red? He's like, oh God, yes, please stop. <laughs> <laughs> so most uh, traffic lights now are, are done in, it's, 
it doesn't look like it's uh, red, yellow, and green, but it looks very different to me. Um, like the, the green looks very white to me, like I don't see it as green at all. The red looks very dark to me, but I can still see that it's lit up. And the yellow just looks like mystery color, like it might be orange, maybe yellow, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so that was done with the colorblind community in mind. That was changed because of that. That's community. right, yes. And it, it doesn't look changed really to us, but it does to you guys. Yes, that's that right. That is very interesting. Uh, I, my understanding is like in Romania, Possibly other countries they have illegal. It's not legal to drive with colored blindness. Oh. oh wow. Well. That's something that I guess you know when you look locally, mm -hmm. there's still like an opportunity to evolve on that. Mm -hmm. Right. That's interesting. I've never heard that. Yes. I was just curious because um, you mentioned that a lot of people in your family have the same type of color blindness, um, but were you uh, was your color blindness discovered at a very young age and do you That's interesting. So the question is, what age is colorblindness typically discovered, and kind of how is it discovered for me? So my mom was the first of all of her siblings to have children. So I was kind of like the test dummy for this. And I, uh, it, they didn't discover it until I was in kindergarten, where I failed. I, you know, I, I went to a nurse, and uh, you know, she like held out a box of crayons, and she asked me to name all the crayons, and I couldn't name all of the crayons, like just you know, with, without seeing the labels. Uh, so the nurse called my mom and said, like, I think your son has a learning disability. <laughs> and my mom asks, why do you think that? You know, the nurse explains it. And my mom said, well, you know, colorblindness runs in my family. Did it occur to you that maybe the test was for colorblindness? And the nurse was like, oh, I guess that actually kind of does make sense. So that was when we learned it from me. Um, I, I can't speak in general, but I know that in my family, it was like once they knew that I was colorblind, like the new generation, so to speak, was, you know, kind of tested very early. So that when my cousin Jerry... Um, went to school. They already knew he was colorblind. It was something that they figured out from the time that you know you can teach a, a child colors. In the back. Have you, thought, uh, have you ever thought about using custom style sheets, as in um, setting links in your browser to be a color that you can see? So have I thought about using custom style sheets? So the one. <coughs> way that I can do that is using extensions like readability, which strip away all the styling and so on and so forth of, of web pages to present it in a, a man in like a readable manner. The strictly speaking the the issue with that is that I would need to do something for not just the text but the background too to like so that it would stand out from the text. Um, so like it's like on one side like maybe I could like toggle it on and off. Um, but if I, if I left it all the time, I feel like it would kind of ruin the web experience to like to like highlight it like that. Um, but that is an interesting point. I've never actually considered that. That's a that's an interesting thought. I just wanted to say we had a few people watching the live stream today, which is their first time. Oh, welcome to the live stream. Comment from the live stream saying from Deborah Edwards, Anora, thunder the talk of red and blue, given all the red and blue today's political ads slash news for Super <laughs> Tuesday. So I guess, you know, it's just another observation that I guess our political campaigners mm -hmm. often use that color combination as well. But I, I find that they don't mix, right? That's the idea, is that the reds <laughs> and the blues, <laughs> <laughs> they never overlap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I was just saying, thanks for a great presentation. Great. Happy to hear it. Thank you for watching. Last call for questions? All right. Well, thank you, Jake. All right. And, uh, Yes, I can. I just realized the captions are not <laughs> capturing. I'm sorry, I didn't okay. realize I was going to do that. Uh, <laughs> I, I saw Sean like curiously signing. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Okay. Um, so I want to thank you again. I want to say thank you to ThoughtBot. Thank you to SSB Bart. And uh, you're welcome to stick around.
around for another like half an hour or so. So get to know people, talk, there's some more pizza, uh, grab a drink, and enjoy yourselves. Thanks again. Thank you. Hey. Thank you for having me.